The Adirondack Canoe Classic, which is also sometimes called the 90 Miler, is, at least in my opinion, one of the great North American canoe races. There's this huge culture around the Adirondack Canoe Classic. And then there's always been this subculture. There's a handful of people, not too many, but certainly a couple of boats every year that complete the Cannonball 90, or the Outlaw 90 as it's sometimes called, which is completing the whole 90 miler route. They make it from Old Forge to Saranac Lake in a calendar day. Mike and I, as we started to get into the culture of the 90 miler, we've now competed in it six times. So it was something that had been on our radar for a number of years. And then finally, I think, you know, maybe the lack of doing the 90 miler last year due to COVID, it just kind of got us talking about making that a reality and, and actually trying to do the Outlaw 90. To prepare for this, you have to be somewhat used to long paddling days. So we've done the three day version of this multiple times in the past. You know, the longest day out there that we've had somewhere between eight and nine hours. So we're kind of used to the experience of being in the boat and doing this kind of activity for a long time. So one of the first challenges was the fact that we were starting at midnight. So that meant at 10.30 we were headlamps on, loading up the car, making sure we were ready to go so that we could drive down to Old Forge and start the day at midnight. Yeah. A little nervous. We picked about the darkest night we could find. Luckily the wind should be pretty quiet, so that's a relief. But yeah, should be good. I would say I'm most worried about just my lack of sleep going into it. I was up at 6 a.m. this morning, it's midnight now, and I haven't slept at all, despite trying. And now we're headed into probably 20 hours of paddling. So the boat that we chose to do this in is the Winona Minnesota 2. It's made out of Kevlar, so it's quite light. I think it's 42 pounds. It's 18 and a half feet long, fairly narrow as, as a non-race specific boat goes. So it's, it's very quick, it's very efficient, but it also offers just more stability and comfort than a pure racing boat would, and more versatility as a boat to own. You know, we go camping in it, we get to do all kinds of different paddling in that boat. So it works really well for us, and it was a no-brainer that that was what we were going to be paddling in for this paddle in the dark a handful of times, not for this length of distance, but should be fine. The biggest worry we have going into this is definitely the carries. There's eight of them, 10 if you include carrying around the locks, and they add up to about six miles cumulative, and just carrying the boat for that is, is pretty rough. First, the novelty of paddling at night kind of won out. And so morale was pretty high through that section at first because it was just so new and exciting. And then that wore off. <laughs> right about at midnight, the rain started. And we were hoping that it, it wouldn't rain, of course. Had seen on the weather that there was the potential of a little bit of rain, but even at that point, we were thinking, okay, it might drizzle for a little while, all's gonna be well. Pretty shortly thereafter, the drizzle turned into a downpour. It starts to get in your head when you see the water sloshing around the boat that you're carrying around an extra, I don't know, eight pounds of water or something, and that's not what you want. Plus the movement of it doesn't help you when you're in the water. So at the end of the first carry, I got a little bit more worried about the water. Mike 
was all of a sudden quite cold and I saw him shaking and I knew that that could be a day ender or, or at least really put a damper on it for us. So luckily he had layers and was able to layer up and almost immediately it's good to go and it didn't pose any threat to us. But that was probably the, the, the first moment where it was like, oh, something could go wrong here. It is really wet. Wetter than advertised. That carry was hard. Uh, I think that's going to be our primary challenge today. I think once we're on the water, we can just kind of keep going, but just trying to do six miles of carries fast is really hard. Good to go, dude? Yeah, good to go. See you in a bit. Those first four hours, it was pitch black. We would turn our lights on when we were going through more narrow sections, but we actually found that out in the open lakes, having no lights, we were able to see the kind of silhouette of the land best, and that helped us navigate. Without any moon or starlight, it was truly pitch black, especially on the carries. When you, when you got into the woods, it was dark. So we had our headlamps on, but we had to be a little bit careful about footing. The way that Cam and I carry the canoe is slightly unconventional and kind of unique to marathon canoe racing where it's all about efficiency. We don't use the yoke, we don't flip the boat over. Everything that's in the boat stays in the boat and we basically have the bow and stern on our shoulders. That much we are comfortable with, but the darkness and the elements and the rain, I mean, certainly presented some challenges. We had a light on the boat, but when it's above your head, that light's not doing much for you. When you have a boat on your shoulder and the headlamp, the boat kind of darkens, you know, it blocks the, the light reaching the ground for about half of the area in front of you. So just had to pay attention, make sure we didn't fall, because as long as nothing went terribly south, we could just push through and complete the day. One of the most notorious sections of the whole 90 miler route is called Brown's Tract. And it's this short section of stream. I think it's only around two miles long, but it is sinuous and it winds and winds and winds its way down to Raquette Lake. It's so difficult to navigate that we wanted to be there when there was enough light so that we didn't have to do it by headlamp. And we timed it fairly well. We arrived at Brown's Track right as we were getting to Blue Out. Just seeing that little bit of light in the sky brought a new energy to the boat. The great part about it is that it's super, super scenic. It feels super remote. You're just surrounded by trees and you can see mountains in the distance. There's no sign of civilization whatsoever. From a technical standpoint, it, it slows you down and it forces you to paddle more technically than you are in a lot of the bigger lakes, which is a fun change of pace after going through a whole bunch of lakes prior to that. But it does obviously slow down your overall average speed. The only other major challenge with it is there's probably a handful of beaver dams, most of which you can't really run through with the canoe. So you have to stop and climb over them, drag the boat over them, and then press on from there. We probably had to do that three or four times over the course of that two and a half mile stretch. difficulty of any particular section can vary a lot day to day based on the conditions. So if it's a windy day, the river sections are going to be your savior and the big lakes are going to be absolutely terrible. On the other hand, on a fairly windless day or at least not particularly windy day like we lucked out on, the lakes are fantastic. We were able to, especially on Raquette Lake, which is sometimes huge waves, it was almost like glass and we just 
cruised across it. But some of the river sections were tough. They were shallow or rocky, and that posed a significant challenge for us, more than we thought, honestly. We ended up taking, I think, almost an hour for a mile and a half section, which was quite demoralizing uh, when we had been going closer to five miles an hour for most of the day. One of the neat things is every time you do this route, every section of it is different and you'll find something new and you can kind of prep for what'll be difficult, but a section that was easy last time might prove really daunting this time through. It was getting, getting dark, both uh, literally and uh, in our head, so things are things are better now. I'm sure we'll hit another wall at some point, but for now we're we're riding this wave of happiness. Undoubtedly, the two hardest portages of the day are the Racket Falls carry and what's known as the Indian carry. And those two come in fairly short succession. I think there's only maybe six miles of paddling in between them, and the. Racket Falls carry, you go up and over this hill, it's a pretty big little ridge, and then you drop down, and that is always very difficult in the race, and then also in this. And then the Indian carry is not in the normal 90 miler race, but that one, I don't know. I think it, part of it is that you're just exhausted by that point in the day, but every time I've done it in other paddles, it has really taken it out of me. And the last section was really hard. Coming up Stony Creek, it was extremely shallow and we had to get out and wade through knee-deep mud a couple of times and really hurt the average speed, pushed a, our end time back a good bit and hurt morale. We're both just hitting the wall. It's been a long day. The Buttermilk Falls carry, the path kind of diverges and at first we're taking the leftmost trail and then we realized that we wanted the, the right trail. And in that maneuvering there, Mike slipped briefly. Oh. Oh. You all right, dude? Yeah. Take a minute, yeah, take a minute. Push the old back out. You know, we got really lucky. He was fine, the boat was fine. We were able to just keep going a minute later. But those kind of moments where you're really tired and your reaction time isn't as quick as it was before, that's when things can, can go south. The light at the end of the tunnel was the fact that we would be meeting our pit crew at the end of that carry and getting more food and restocking. I think on the water we're still making good time and not hurting too bad, but the carries are just For a while, though. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mike miscounted our carries. Yeah, I really f***ed up on my opening. I just my opening trust piece him. of camera. I never recounted them. <laughs> I checked them off. What is it, six? I think I said eight. You said eight. It was ten. ten. Uh, I said six miles, and it's really like ten, ten miles. It's ten miles of carrying. Yeah. Holy. Sh We've done by five. When we're sitting in the boat for five hours racing, we're kind of head down, we're pretty silent, honestly, and we're just working as hard as we can. Here, we found it was really helpful to keep conversation flowing, and the conversation helped the hours tick by. And if you were just looking at your watch, Time was moving slowly. You know, you'd look down and only three minutes would have passed and you knew that you had 10 more hours to go and that was painful. We came up with these ways to just pass time. We would tell each other stories about uh, podcasts or movies or books that we had consumed recently and the other one hadn't and we would try to recite them as well as we could. Surprisingly, that kind of just processing in your head took your mind completely off of what was going on and helped get us through the day. Since our goal is to complete it in a calendar day, 
and we started at midnight. We had exactly 24 hours to finish this. And as we start to slow down, all of a sudden you see your buffer in order to make it in 24 hours. It starts to shrink a little bit. Yeah, this is the hardest day of activity I've ever done in my life. Definitely harder than doing the 90 over three days. Yeah, I'm pretty dead, but we're still able to paddle pretty well, but we're pretty slow on land and we're pretty slow whenever it gets more technical with twisty, turny stuff. We, we just don't have the power anymore. We were aiming to finish in 20 hours. Might be closer to 21 at this point. We slowed down and running a little behind, but in that range and the sun should be setting right about when we finish. So hopefully we won't have to put the headlamps back on. That's the goal. I'm hoping to finish by nine. So that would be 21 hours. 21 consecutive hours. That's the goal paddling. of paddling. 21 consecutive hours of paddling. We knew there was only four miles to go to Saranac Lake. We've done that a bunch of times, and we see the sun setting. Those last four miles were a race. It was a race against the sun. We did not want to have to stop and pull the headlamp out. So the goal was just to get to Saranac Lake before the sun set. And I think the sun had set, but it was not dark yet. So we succeeded in that sense, I guess. There was this huge rush of relief when we finished. We had set this goal out there that seemed almost unachievable, at least to us, and then we were able to do it. It's just kind of for us, it's a personal challenge. It wasn't a race. We weren't trying to do it in a specific time. It's an addicting feeling, I think, and that's part of what gets us out here, is pushing our limits, seeing where our limits are, and doing our best to overcome them. Woo, good job, boys! Today we pushed ourselves moderately hard just for a really, really long <laughs> period of time but for the course of 21 hours. I mean, it's certainly the longest, this is probably the longest amount of activity paddling that I've ever done. Yeah, I mean, it checks a box, it checks a challenge we set for ourselves, something we want to do for a while and it's good to get, get it done. Well, it feels really amazing to have checked off. One of those dreams that kind of like hangs there for a, for a while and I'm so glad that we were able to do it and we were able to finish it off and yeah, I think it will all kind of hit me later but um, I'm just super, super excited to have done it. Oh, this train is running late Might seem a little far away But I'll get there someday I still know the way